Kid, seriously. touched on at the beginning uh, of this show. Uh, last week, I was not here for recording, and I think that might be kind of why we encountered so many technical problems that basically resulted in there not even being an episode. Um, so, and the reason why I wasn't there is because I was attending leg number one of the MLS Cup Western Conference Finals, watching my new second favorite team, the Portland Timbers take on Sporting Kansas City, and it was quite an experience. Um, like I said, I sat for the first time. Well, not really sat. I stood in the Timbers Army section, which was quite an experience. Um, I previously, you know, when I go to sporting events, um, when I go to soccer matches, I like to sit. And I like to be a little quiet at times because I like watching. And I like making sure that I don't miss anything that's happening on the field and so I also obviously prefer being at the midline where you get the best sights. Here you're behind the goal so it's a little tough to see what's happening on the opposite end. Everybody's standing and cheering and flags are waving and so your view is constantly obstructed. There's smoke going off when you get a goal scored that's then called back for bullshit reasons. Um, and it was it was really an experience and I enjoyed it. Um, I was really tired afterwards because being on your feet for two hours at, at my advanced age is not an easy thing to do. Um, but it was really great. And it was interesting too, because when you really get into it with the chanting and the singing, it's really easy to kind of lose yourself in that mob and to really be experience a game on, I want to say more of an emotional level where you're not, you're not, as critically observant of what's going on, you're really more just feeling the environment. And so that got me thinking too, because the day before I'd gone to that game, I know that Luke had the opportunity to see Paul Bunyan's ax returned to the rightful owners, the University of Minnesota Gophers, as they beat Wisconsin in their own home field. So it was quite the weekend for the, uh, the Brothers Knights all on the sporting events. And that made me want to ask both of you, what is the greatest sporting event you've attended live and why? Um, I've got my own answer, but I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you guys say first. So I had a lot of difficulty coming up with my answer for this one. My first ever sporting event was in 1987, and it was a Minnesota Twins game, and I was a huge Kirby Puckett fan. And they won in a walk-off 2-1 uh, victory with Tom Bernanski getting the game-winning RBI, um, and Robin Yount missed, uh, missed the play at the play, or missed like a throw, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, I saw a bunch of 1988 Dodger games when I moved out to California in the 90s. I got to see uh, the, the Raiders versus the Packers. I got to see three U.S. national team games, all of which were awesome. One was against Cuba, um, and then two were with Luke. But my favorite experience in a stadium of all time, and it's, it's in the same place where Luke had his last week, and that was the Wisconsin Badger versus Nebraska Cornhusker game in 2014. As you guys know, college football is my favorite sport. And though I've been to a lot of college football games, this was the first Badger game, and it was the first game that had that crazy college atmosphere that you see on TVs at some SEC schools. The game itself was a ton of fun. Melvin Gordon set the record for single rushing yards in a game, and it got beat the next week by the guy from Oklahoma, but that was all right. But I think the real reason that it was my favorite is because it was the first time that I really felt in my soul that I really understood what it was like to be a Wisconsinite. I've moved a ton of times in my life, more than 30, to be honest, and it was the first time that I truly felt part of a community. I've always been a fan of teams from afar, um, for all my teams, really. And I think it helped me understand like how those London neighborhood teams feel, not to that extent, obviously, because that's mm -hmm. like neighborhood. But for me, it was like the first time I felt like truly like a Wisconsinite. And it kind of changed my opinion um, of, of just kind of what it meant to be part of the state. And I, I've always been kind of embarrassed about being Wisconsinite to that point. And it, I had a ton of pride and like, I, I loved it. And I, I don't think you're even selling that game properly because we were not together, but we were both at that game together. Well, we were both at that game, just not together. Um, on top, you know, it, it was a big win over a big school. 
Melvin Gordon set that record, and it was one of those things where everyone just kept looking at that yardage because they put the yardage on the scoreboard, and you knew he was close, and you knew he was close, and he kept going, and it was that exhilaration. But it was also Also, snowing. It was a night game, and it was snowing. So you're, like, in the lights of Camp Randall, which seats, I don't know, 70,000 people or whatever. The snow is falling down, and it's, like, every time you're, like... I remember there being some plays where they... And I'm I'm not a I'm not particularly a Badger fan. My partner is. Her family are massive Badger fans. You know I'm a Gopher fan first, but because of their love for it, I've, I, when they're not playing the Gophers, I cheer for them. Like you could not help but be swept up in that that moment. And I remember there being plays where they would pass the ball and just this collective everyone looking around, being like, "The fuck are you doing? Just give it to Gordon. Like let him do this." And then he and then he did it. So that that's awesome. I. That was that. That definitely is one to remember. So I, th- I had trouble with this question as well because I'm very spoiled as far as sports experiences go. I worked for a, a radio network and and got to do a lot of sports experiences for that. So like I've I've sat on the sideline literally with my hand, my knees in the chalk, for um you know a Vikings practice while I'm taking pictures of Randy Moss catching passes and all that. I was at Randy Moss's first game in the end zone where he caught two of his three touchdowns against the Bucks. Um, and I was standing right next to you. You were standing right next to me, and it was it was insanity. I was at the playoff win against the Cardinals they had that year as well. Um, I've seen the Gophers win, not national championships, unfortunately, but I've seen them win Big Ten titles in overtime. Or not Big Ten, but WCHA at the time, titles in overtime against North Dakota. Thank you, Blake Wheeler. Um I, I, and and I came down it came down to two. One was I was at I hockey's been my passion since I was 13 years old and I spent all of my teenage years wishing for Minnesota to have a team because we had lost the North Stars and I got to go to the first wild preseason game so it was the first ever game at the Excel Energy Center that they ever played and it was against the Ducks who was against Paul Correa who was one of my all-time favorite players who wasn't a Red Wing Uh, but what it really for me is is it's about it's about my son actually because my son is he's 8 years old right now. Uh he's our bear, that's what we call him. It's not his name. We didn't name our kid Bear. Uh we promise, even though people look at us funny when we call him that. Like they they're worried it's his name, but he he's a soccer fan. He has enjoyed soccer with me growing up. And his favorite player since he was like 3 or 4 years old was a guy who is a mediocre MLS player that we love. Like I say slightly above mediocre named uh Dilly Duca. And he loved Dilly Duca. He loved him since he was like three, four years old and he played for the fire and he would make signs for him and we would go to games and we would take pictures of the signs and we'd put them on Twitter and Dilly Duca would like them and be like, hey, thanks, buddy, you know, type type thing on Twitter. And he's a little kid and he thought this was the most amazing thing. Well, Dilly Duca got traded because the fire are fucking stupid when it comes to player management. <laughs> they traded him to Montreal for uh, a, a dude that we got rid of after like a month. But they, they traded Dilly Duca and my son was devastated and he he made us he was like, Can we send him a sign? So he made a sign himself. Like I had to help him spell it because he was too little to spell it, but it was like, I'll miss you, but my dad told me I could take you to the game. So we took a we took a picture of him holding the sign being like, When Montreal comes to Chicago, we will go because you know, we love you. And and Dilly Duca sent back a message saying Thank you for all your support. I'm sending you free tickets. So he sent us four tickets to go to this game. My wife, my partner couldn't actually come. So I brought her sister or whatever. And then like we, we went and even though I'm a lifelong fire fan, we wore, I bought tons of blue. I bought him a Montreal Jersey. I told my sister-in-law, you have to wear blue. And we went and we sat in the fire stadium in the opposing fans section. And we watched a zero, zero tie with Montreal, with my son and his little, his little Montreal impact Jersey and the, the game ended and he was so excited. And, and Dilly Duca had sent me a text message being like, just, just stick around after the game or whatever. And like, uh, one of the players, Callum Malice came over and gave him a high five. There aren't a lot of Montreal fans that show up in Chicago. Cause it's a long distance. And, uh, Dilly Duca came over to him and my son jumped into his arms and he hugged my son and, and then, my son, I kind of pulled my son back and, and, uh, he took off his, his, Dilly Duca took off his like warm up shirt, his Montreal Impact warm up shirt that he had worn because he had been subbed out of the game. So he put this warm up shirt on and he, he gave it, he gave it to my son. 
And, uh, you know, my son and well, we have pictures because luckily my sister-in-law is good at taking pictures. So she took a lot of pictures of this and he gave it to my son. And then he, he went back to be with his friends and stuff like that. Dilly Duke did or whatever. And my son is holding the shirt. He's like five years old and he wraps his arms around me and he started to cry and he was holding Dilly Duke's shirt and he said, dad, I'm the luckiest kid on the face of the earth. And that, you know, he's eight years old now. So that was three, four years ago. And that shirt is still on a hanger hanging in his bedroom above his bed. And, you know, like that, that's a kid who will love soccer for the rest of his life because it may seem like a small gesture from a player to do that thing. But for a, you know, a four or five year old kid, it's a life changing thing. And to see that amount of joy in your child is, is something you can't replace. So there's nothing, there's not the bad, you know, the Gophers winning the ax, the wild being at their first game or winning a Stanley cup, even that can replace seeing uh, your, your kid get that. So that that's mine. Okay. Well, I would like to thank you for making my selection of watching David Beckham fight the quakes mascot completely (laughs) anticlimactic. It's still pretty good. (laughs) <laughs> Who won, by the way? Was that was that Q or was that the uh, Cyber Dog? <laughs> no, that was Q. That oh, was good. That was um, Rick Flair and Smurfette's bastard son, nice. Q, the Quakes mascot. Though, re- rest in peace. I can't remember what your name. I think it was like Laser the Cyber Dog or whatever that was. But his his whatever his name was after it, it definitely said the Cyber Dog. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, no, mine mine was actually. Um, and it's going to be so lame after that wonderful story you told. But mine was the um, California Classico uh, in 2012, the Stanford Stadium, the Quakes versus the LA Galaxy. This was the first season uh, that I was a season ticket holder. And at the time, the Quakes were playing in Buckshaw Stadium, which, Luke, you had the opportunity to see how small and dumpy and like third rate high school a stadium that was. And, and this was the first time I got to see the Quakes in a real massive stadium. And it was sold out. And the energy was insane. And it was um, an absolutely terrific game. I When MLS periodically does polls about the greatest MLS game of all time, this is usually in the top three that get picked. Um, it wound up being 4-3 Quakes with the Quakes coming from behind uh, down three to Really, they're down three to two, um, and it featured you know David Beckham scoring a goal off of a free kick. Um, John Bush got his eye basically broken in the middle of the game, so they had to sub in the goal the the goalie for David Bingham back when he was decent. Um, I, you know, Wondolowski scored the game winner. Um, you had the fights afterwards with you know Beckham and the Quakes mascot pushing each other. Um, it was really just, for me, it was really terrific because it was the first time I got to see my team play in what felt like a professional setting. Um, and it was just an awesome game. Um, well, but, and I, I think there's, because what, it, I mean, the, what do you think the seating capacity was in that game? Like how many fans were in the stadium for that game? I think I think they clocked it at like around 57,000. Which for, um, for you, you know, seeing a soccer game, you know, we have a 20,000 seat stadium in Bridgeview, Illinois, that I watched the fire in and we've gotten a few games, but like a sellout is like, we're really excited for it. And I know we're, we're the second worst team for attendance or whatever, but I remember going to a U.S. national team game against Honduras. It was a world cup qualifier. I went there with Maya and was that with Mrs. Madrid or was that the one with, that was the Poland game. That was the Poland game that Mrs. Madrid went to, who is like the world's biggest trooper because she was like, I don't know, eight months pregnant or something and still followed us around to the soccer game, which she probably didn't care about. But anyway, like I remember sitting in this Honduras U.S. game at Soldier Field and it was sold out, which is like 60,000 or whatever and being like, and and what, what would you say, 70% Honduras fans? easily and sitting there being like, I can't believe I'm in a U.S. soccer game with this many people. Granted, most of them are cheering against the U.S. So to be in a domestic game where there's 50,000 fans is something I, to this day, have still never experienced and just can't imagine for U.S. soccer. So that had to have been awesome at Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was pretty amazing. Um, and you know, of course the, the ultras, you know, had the, the big TIFO. It was also, it was the first time that I'd seen like a really large, you know, well done TIFO. I mean, I've obviously seen plenty since then. Um, 
but yeah, it was, it was the first time to really have that, that feeling of, um, wow, this is what it's like to watch a game in Europe. Um, because, and I actually, I had been to the Timbers stadium. Um, my first game was ever was Timbers, uh, 2011 at Providence park. So I saw a, a huge enthusiastic crowd, um, but even still, that's only like 17,000 people. I mean, they, they sound like 30, 40,000. But, but it's not the same. 17,000. It's not the same. No, no. So to, to see to see that quality of game in that size stadium um, sold out was um, really tremendous. Um, although it doesn't have the greatest moment I ever experienced, which was the one the next year where Alan Gordon scored the header in overtime. Um, to beat them again uh, that was the most insane moment I've ever seen but that game up until the last 90 seconds wasn't that great to watch so um, yeah all right uh, thank you for sharing everybody good answers all that's always full of good answers here on the kids seriously show hey Luke we're gonna bring this show to an end but where can the uh, the, the massive throngs of viewers and listeners find you well all my 22 followers on twitter find me at luke underscore nitzel n-e-i-t-z-l on twitter well you can find me all one word um there's no underscore like i falsely said last time we recorded for like it's four months for like for like three shows it's been like it's been like a month of you telling us you had an underscore and us being like you really don't yeah, it, it, it turns out that there's um no underscore and i'm gonna blame that for the reason why i've only got 93 followers but i'm at wink martindale five on twitter also i just want to i just want to clarify for prosperity you know uh it's it's richter the cyber dog because obviously earthquakes richter the cyber dog it's the best named cyber dog i've ever heard of my favorite cyber dog i and my madrid together we are at kids seriously you can follow us on twitter and soon we will be on the itunes which is exciting, but um, until then, we'll see you later, guys. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at Kid Seriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.